So my name is Carla Dupre, the Executive Director of City Lit Project. We're a small literary nonprofit in Baltimore, Maryland, designed to create enthusiasm for literature with three signature events. The month-long City Lit Festival, scheduled for March 2022, the City Lit Stage each fall, and the City Lit Studio. We've been supporting readers and writers since 2004. Before I talk about what this evening looks like, how are you doing? I mean, are we good? Can you give me, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, just all right, okay? Anybody? Okay. Looks like a lot of you are good. Well, we get it. Our hope is that you take this moment to forget about what's going on in the world, in the neighborhood, or if you can manage it in your home. And we can, can you make these two hours about you and your literary work? This time of year, we look forward to this small intimate group to gather, to talk about craft, to lean in and become a little vulnerable because that's what we do as writers when we see and face a blank page. Many of you are Zoomed out at the meetings today, but we're delighted to have you join us and engage with the authors we've assembled tonight. We, we invite you to keep on your video, no matter how bad you look, so the authors can see your beautiful faces and read the room. But we are clear if you prefer not to, that's most certainly your choice. City and Studio, a writer to writer exchange is created as part of Free Fall Baltimore, presented by BG&E and the Maryland State Arts Council and produced by Baltimore Office of Promotion in the Arts, better known as BOPA. The annual celebration features free arts and cultural events at participating venues and organizations throughout Baltimore City and throughout October. We're deeply thankful to them and to our many sponsors who believe in the work we do and also the individual citizens out there who have invested in our small literary nonprofit over the years and through these remarkable times. Our bookseller for tonight's event is Greedy Reads. Please support this fabulous independent bookseller and the authors by purchasing their books. We'll provide a link in the chat throughout the evening. At the end of the studio, we will place a Google survey in the chat with the hope you will fill it out before you leave. As well, if you're up to it, we'll say goodbye to our authors and many of you at nine o'clock. But for those of you who wanna hang out a little bit, to 9.15 in chat, we're all for it. You can spend time filling out the survey and just telling us about what you want and what's your next step. Feel free to do so. We know you're busy. And once this is over, you'll be off and running to the next thing. But these days funding is much more challenging. So please know any evaluations that you fill out provide data to the sponsors who will help us continue these events for free. Before we get started, allow me to introduce to you to the two city board members we have present today. We have Dana Harris Travato, our fabulous chair, and Aditya Desai, our extraordinary secretary. The studio is meant to be an intense volume of information in a very short span of time, designed to arm you with enough juice and energy to want to return to your own work. The handouts each author provides is very much like a roadmap to get you there. So we want you to turn off your worries, be present. After both authors speak, you'll have a good 20 minutes to ask them questions. We don't always have the benefit of having someone in the room to guide or direct us in our work. So we want you to take full advantage of this time, engage fully, take notes, jot down your questions to ask during the Q&A or place them in the chat. We understand there are introverts in the house, so we hope to honor all questions presented. You should know too, for the purposes of our archives, we are recording this session and we hope this isn't problematic for anyone. While many of you may be familiar with Zoom, allow me to introduce Aditya, who will cover a few features you should be aware of to make this an enjoyable experience. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to go over a few things real quick, uh, just about uh, the Zoom etiquette as we're kind of going through tonight's, uh, tonight's event. Just give me one quick second. I'm going to screen share something just for a few minutes, uh, so bear with me if your screens are getting a little bit jerky um, while we kind of go through this. But uh, yeah, just a few kind of ground rules to follow that might help us make sure this evening goes along pretty well. Um, if you want to make sure your microphone is muted, which it seems like most of you are, um, that would just be great cutting back on feedback or ambient noise. Um, video, of course, as Carla said, is welcome, so please do show your faces. Uh, of course, if you would prefer not to, that is totally fine. But um, don't uh, hold back from it if you would like to make that contact. Uh, it definitely makes for a better experience. Um, we invite you to edit your name um, on your on your Zoom window. Uh, if you're not sure how to do that, there should be a little uh, you know, a, a ellipses, three dots icon 
um, near your video window and you'll see the option to rename yourself. You can also do that from the participants list on the Zoom, on the Zoom app. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to edit your name however you prefer to be referred to as well as any pronouns as well. Um, and that would just be good when we start taking questions and things just, you know, to make things a little bit more personable and make sure that we're getting the sort of connections that, uh, that uh, we're all kind of craving um, through the virtual world. Um, introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't yet, uh, as well as where you're coming from. Um, and yeah, as Carlos said, this meeting will be recorded for future posting online. So uh, if there are things that uh, either of our presenters say that uh, strike your, your brain and, and get you get your juices flowing and maybe you didn't get a chance to write it down or mark it down, um, this video will be online later for your approval. So if you're not, if something slides by. Um, just a couple other things to review before we get onto the rest of our program. Um, so I'll keep this really quick and we'll get to our presenters. Um, so this is studio, the Studio 6. This is the sixth edition of this program that we're going through. Um, uh, and it has been done in wonderful partnership with the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts. Uh, BOPA is our kind of our local arts organization that manages and um, administers a lot of the programming in the city. It supports a lot of the programming in the city. Um, and this is part of their free fall uh, slate of programming, which is a series of free events that happen every year uh, in October around Baltimore. Um, and this year we're proud to um, be again, once again, supported by them for the studio. They, they're the ones who are funding it every year along with um, some of these other sponsors from around, uh, around, uh, yeah, around town. So um, I think that's, I think that's the thing that's our you know, ad read as they say in, in the radio world. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Carla um, if you want to take it off the rest of the program. Thank you so much. First up is Leslie P Petrick. Leslie is a longtime friend to City Lit and one incredibly generous literary citizen. Her collection of linked stories set in DC, Admit This to No One, is forthcoming this November from Unnamed Press, the publisher of her, of her 2018 novel, Silver Girl, which received a star review from Publishers Weekly. Her first collection of short stories, This Angel on My Chest, won the 2015 Drew Hines Literature Prize. Leslie's short fiction and essays have appeared in Plowshare, Story Magazine, The Sun, Salon, and The Washington Post Magazine, among others. She's won a Pushcart Prize in 2020 and the 2020 Creative Arts Prize from the Polish American Historical Association. Organizations have awarded her fellowships, including Bread Loaf Writers Conference, the Swanee Writers Conference, the Hermitage Artists Retreat, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Hawthornden International Retreat, at the Hawthornden Castle in Scotland. A castle? <laughs> How many of us can boast that? Kirkus gave her a star review and declared Admit This to No One, a collection of stories set in Washington, DC, full of scandal and insider details. An exciting, you can't even see that from my virtual thing. We'll, we'll figure that out. An exciting collection bristling with intelligence, political awareness, and psychological complexity. Please give a warm welcome to Leslie Petrick. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, I am so delighted to be here with all of you um, from North Carolina where I moved like two weeks ago. So all around me are a bunch of unopened boxes, but this is an area of calm and peace and writerness. Um, I'm so grateful to Carla and City Lit for this wonderful program, thank you. And I'm gonna talk about my, uh, my two short story collections and some of the issues that I faced in writing and structuring these books and mostly the ways that I thought about how and why I decided to use my life experiences as a basis for my art. So first, a bit of background. As Carla said, I have a book of short stories coming out on November 9th, Admit This to No One, and it's set in DC in what I will call official DC because there's lots of, um, lots of DCs for everybody. And my book is an examination of various power structures. And so there are a number of linked stories about a tangled political family. But also there are several stories that I consider more deeply personal and vulnerable coming from my experience and my ongoing education over the past several years in working to understand the things I grew up not understanding about race in America and about my complicity 
as a beneficiary of a corrupt power system. Complicity that I, white woman raised in Iowa, white liberal woman with good intentions living in the suburbs, complicity I felt morally obligated to confront through that, that lens of power, asking how did I, or the I of these stories, contribute to the pain of other people. And so my assignment to myself while working on some of the stories in this book was to choose the most uncomfortable option. What can happen here that is uncomfortable? How can I make the, my character the most uncomfortable? How can I make the reader squirm? How can I make myself squirm? So I'll touch on that book a little bit. But mostly, I'm going to focus on This Angel on My Chest, which won the 2015 Drew Hines Literature Prize and was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. It's a collection of short stories that I call unconventionally linked because they are linked by circumstance, not as is perhaps typical by the same characters or all taking place in you know, somewhere like Washington, DC. So each of these 16 stories deals with the aftermath of the death of a young husband. Yes, literally I am saying that each story is about the exact same thing. Yes, that may be an outrageously peculiar premise for a book. Nevertheless, that's the book I seem to have to write. And it's also an unconventional book because the stories are told in several different forms, including a quiz, a list, an index, a YouTube video, and a craft lecture on point of view that features 10 different points of view. These stories are based on the death of my first husband. And I've blurred fact and fiction quite a bit and I'm quick to announce so. I think it even says it in the, the jacket cup copy. And that means, as you can imagine, that this for me is a very deeply personal book. And because apparently this is what I do when I write, I also had an assignment for myself here. And the initial assignment when I was writing about this time of my life, when I realized I was putting together a collection of these stories, was that each story had to include one hard, true thing from my personal experience of grieving Rob's death, an incident or an observation or an emotional truth. It wasn't my intention that readers spend their energy worrying about what's true and what really happened, but I wanted to capture the resonance of the universal experience of loss and grief. And that's the paradox of grief, that it is both universal because we will all lose someone if we haven't already it's coming one of these days and yet grief is also utterly individual and you know this if you have lost someone you feel that your heartbreak is the worst and only pain in the world and so i wouldn't typically use my own work as a basis for a craft talk but when one is talking about moving life material between fact and fiction, I'm not sure it's possible to use other work and extrapolate with 100% accuracy from bi biographical knowledge. But here, in this case, I actually am the authority on my life and my book, and I'm able to speak with knowledge of my own intentions. And for anyone who's writing poetry here, maybe, um, and also using your, their lives or experience as a source material, I just wanna assure you that the general principles of what I'm saying definitely apply to, um, to poetry, to that genre. So I'm not saying poetry, um, but that doesn't mean I'm excluding poets. You'll just need to sort of mentally adapt my remarks into the parameters of your practice. Okay, so the first question that I asked myself was why write fiction instead of a memoir? And then why blur the two as I've purposefully done in this angel on my chest? I will never say that one genre is better than another. And everyone is perfectly welcome to write whatever they want. But speaking for myself, I've always been primarily a fiction writer because I like to hide. I'm from the Midwest. And while I'm not willing to say, here's a whole book about me, 
I can say, here's a book about other women whose husbands have died. Here are some stories about another woman, not me, with my good intentions, who didn't understand the microaggression she perpetuated at the grocery store, as in the new book. That was me, by the way, but it's easier to hide in a story. And sometimes hiding can help you get to truer truths. But still, I felt like when I was pondering this, that that was sort of the simple answer. Uh, so I always write fiction, so I'll write fiction. I wasn't really content with those surface reasons. And so again, all genres are incredibly powerful. So I'm gonna offer a glimpse of my thought process as I pondered the questions more deeply. Why fiction? Why not a memoir about my, my husband and his death? So as a writer, we always think about the audience, the reader. How can we keep the reader invested and keep them flipping those pages? For me, being allowed to invent things was a powerful tool I was not willing to give up. So early on, I did turn to fiction. As I said, it's the genre I know best and it's the one I'm most comfortable in. And one of the reasons I'm comfortable on teen fiction is that I like taking something half interesting that happened to me and adding the elements needed to make the event fully interesting. Embellishing, raising the stakes, tossing in the unexpected, watching a character suddenly reveal a secret or tell a lie. To be very basic, my own life just isn't that interesting. It's so much better for the reader, I believe for me, if I use my personal experience as a jumping off point and then make things up to improve upon them when what actually happened was boring. I also found myself thinking about the book and the story I wanted to tell. Form and structure follow function, I believe, and to arrive at an artful book, there should be a reason for every decision along the way. And if not an active decision, because the subconscious is very important in writing, there should be a justification. Why is this chapter here? What is this character's function? Why am I repeating this same story of the dead husband over and over? Why is this a book, not a memoir? Why do I feel compelled to tell people how I'm blurring truth and fiction? The answer came when I realized that with this angel on my chest, I want the reader to be aware always that there is a living person who died, my husband, and to not forget that. My goal wasn't simply to memorialize him, Rather, I wanted the fact of his real life existence to keep the reader uncomfortable. I didn't want readers to feel easily able to distance themselves from the book and its reality, which is that people die, that my husband died, that we will all die, that you reader will die. We will all mourn and be mourned. Additionally, I wanted my book about grief to look and seem different on the page. I found that when I was grieving, one of the distressing things for me was the way the world looked perfectly normal. Everyone going about their business as I was wrestling with this immense pain. So I wanted my book to reflect that mixed up, surreal feeling experience of living in a world that doesn't feel right anymore. This is also one of the reasons I turn to alternate forms to tell my overall story. And if you look at the pages in my book, there's a lot of strange formatting choices that are purposeful. And so at that point, I felt validated in my decision. I could answer those questions. And I understood why I was writing the book in the way I was as fiction, not memoir. Why I was blurring lines between fact and imagination. Form is following function. And I proceeded with confidence or you know, as much confidence as any writer ever actually feels. Then I started thinking more deeply about what it means to write about my own life, my own experiences, to put myself on the page so openly, so to speak. So I have written and published personal essays, but I can admit to all of you that they're often impersonal, personal essays. And the life experiences that I draw on for those pieces 
have not often required close to the bone revelations and excavations. I knew that writing effectively about my own life would challenge me. How would I be able to write stories that springboard from incidents I now see were racist acts, even considering my good intentions? So I want to move on now to some principles then that I found to be helpful to have in mind when thinking about making that move, even just a small one, into turning your life experiences into fiction or when you're writing in any situation where other real life people might recognize themselves in your work. And so um, these aren't actually in order of priority, except I do think this might be number one. If I were prioritizing, I might say the first principle is to be hardest on yourself. It really takes courage to show your own vulnerabilities and your own bad behavior and any complicity you have to put all that on the page, but you really must. Otherwise you risk running, run the risk of writing a work of revenge. Look at all these, these people and the terrible things they did to me. And naturally this can be tricky. Let's say your material is about surviving sexual abuse or a rape. I certainly am not implying that you should write in such a way as to make yourself seem at fault somehow for those horrible violations. But what I mean is to look at yourself as a character within your situation with immense and difficult honesty. Doing so will establish a bond with the reader who will trust you immediately and who will follow you. As a writer, you'll establish authority when you or the you of the story is portrayed in all your messy complexity. Readers like to see that writers are writing from a place of wisdom and self-awareness that they're not out to get their family members or the other people in the material. A writer who sees that they are flawed is also a writer who can see that the world is flawed as is every person inhabiting it. So always be hardest on yourself. In my case, one example is the story Index of Food. It explores the guilt about me being the one to survive. It admits that I'm happy to be alive and to have continued living and to have gotten remarried. You can imagine how it would feel reading that if you were Rob's mother, right? So that was a hard story to put out there, but I did. Same with the story about the woman who has torrid sex in a restaurant with her brother-in-law, which is titled Slut. That was not so much an emotional hardest on myself situation, but it was an event in a story that I suppose people might think really happened. And I had to understand and accept that risk going into it. I had to make the me of the book look that way, not say Rob's mother being the one to have torrid sex in a restaurant bathroom, which could be an equally good and relevant story, I suppose, and one I could write, but it just didn't feel right for this very personal book for this personal material being expressed in this way where I knew I was purposely blurring fact and fiction. I personally could not do that to Rob's mother. And in my new book, one of the stories that examines racism um, titled, This Isn't Who We Are, lists a dozen or so incidents that would be familiar to um, white liberal suburban life. For example, being proud to donate to Toys for Tots, thinking you're so clever to donate official regulation basketballs, which are more expensive, and seeing third such basketballs already in the donation bin. I could have written a story about the kids getting those basketballs or about the person packing them up to deliver, or I could have tried writing a sympathetic portrait of why a woman decided to donate a basketball but I felt that exposing my own discomfort with my realization that I'm yet another woman thinking every Toys for Tots kid wants a basketball. So I chose an incident from my life and I was hardest on myself. Another thing I suggest is writing your book or your stories in secret, as if family members or the people you're worried about um, 
as if they won't read it. You can worry about them later. People will see themselves where they want to and people will ignore seeing themselves too, surprisingly. Stephen Elliott, um, a writer uh, who I heard speak once, made this very interesting point, which uh, he mostly writes nonfiction. He said, people don't mind if you reveal something they already know about themselves. It's when you reveal something they didn't know that they get riled. For example, if, if someone called me bossy, I'd be like, yeah, I am. But if they revealed something that doesn't sort of fit with my self image, that's where I might be riled. Of course, I would still say they could write about it, but that's um, just an example. And the main point is really write in secret if you need to, so you can write freely and get the words down for yourself. Because you might think you have the book in your head, but it will change and shift. And you have no idea now what will be left standing in the end. Maybe that part you're so worried about will be edited out. Maybe someone will die. I mean, not that we want that to happen, but it's possible. Maybe you and your friend will have a falling out over something else and she won't be in your life by the time you're finished. Often people say things like, I have to wait until my father dies before I can write the story. And no, what you really have to do is write the story as if he is dead and then worry about the shakeout later. And I know, yes, there have been stories of families being unhappy with books. Sometimes these families mend and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the family becomes stronger. Sometimes the family is destroyed, but the author feels comfortable in that decision to expose lies or secrets. Sometimes people react differently than we assume they will. Helen Fremont, a memoirist, um, like chilled me to my bones when she said in a talk about this subject, she said, the people who loved me still loved me after they read my book. The people who turned on me never truly loved me in the first place. So you can't control anyone's reactions. So in this, the purest part of the creative process, don't worry about that. Even though, yes, I know you may need to consider these ramifications later. I get that later. Uh, you may need to wrestle with how you have portrayed racial issues in America and reckon with your failures. But now when you're writing, don't. Now you can just write your book and just not show it to anyone until you're ready. You really can. You can just write. Don't let fear stifle your voice, which leads me to be brave. Tell the story you need to tell. Tell the story that you're afraid to tell. That's where I believe the strongest material comes from, the dark place we all have within us where all our secrets and fears and humiliations and deep truths reside. And this is a fairly common image in talking about writing, but I took it from Margaret Atwood's book about writing called Negotiating with the Dead. And to illustrate her point, she used the myth of Orpheus, the beautiful musician who played the lyre so wonderfully that supposedly no one could resist him, not even the gods. And he fell in love with Eurydice, but on their wedding day, she was bitten by a viper and fell dead. Orpheus was distraught and decided to do what no man had ever done, which was to descend into the underworld, the place of death, and play his music to persuade the rulers of the underworld to let her come back. So after making this perilous journey, the magical music worked and Eurydice was allowed to return under one condition, that Orpheus not look back at her as they made their way up to the living world. And well, you can guess they were almost out or depending on the version, he had just stepped out and thought she was right there. Either way, he glanced back to make sure she was with him. And when he did that, she was lost to him forever. There was no second chance. So while he made it out of the underworld with a story to tell, there was a sacrifice involved in going to that dark place. And so this metaphor for me is really dark. That place of sacrifice is really dark, especially when you consider this. If he didn't look back, the story would be lesser 
as a story. It would end, it would just be, and they lived happily ever after, blah, blah, blah. Of course, if he didn't make it back, there would be no story at all. And that's what you always also need to remember about delving into that um, dark place is that you need to know that you are able and ready to go down there and return with your story. So we all have that dark and scary place, all of us, whether we admit to it or not, whether we poke around in there or not. And saying all this does not mean you must go dredge up, dredge up immense pain and lose your loved one like Orpheus. There are all kinds of books and stories and all kinds of ways of writing. But I suspect that the books we're reading from 100, 200, whatever years ago, the myths that we still know are ones that come from that place that place where we keep our secret selves and our secret shames. There's a reason I titled my new book, Admit This to No One. I was doing a lot of thinking about that dark and scary place. Another point, as I noted previously, ask yourself, why must the audience see this book as true? Why actually is memoir the only way to share this story? I went through this in reverse, wondering why it was that I thought I had to tell everyone that these stories, these made up things, this fiction, why they were, I had to tell everyone they were based on the truth. I could have just taken the truth that resonates and simply gone about my business, but I wanted the reader to feel unsettled. So think about the relationship between yourself and the truth. There are almost always autobiographical elements to fiction. So how comfortable are you about admitting that? Because I promise you that someone in every audience will ask, did that really happen if it's fiction? People want to know, but you don't have to tell them. In fact, I witnessed one of my best writer friends lie directly saying he made up something in response to an audience question. What was funny is that I didn't believe his answer because this was someone I knew quite well. And later over drinks, I dove into the subject with him again and he admitted that he had lied, that the core of the story that he had read, which was a dangerous, violent incident had actually happened to a friend of his. I had never heard my friend lie before about anything. And so I, I literally was shocked that he said, I don't owe that lady in the audience anything. I realized he was right. A good story is enough. It doesn't matter if it's true or isn't in the end. Do we have to know if Romeo and Juliet were actually two people? Or do we just need to believe that they are real to us? So this is to say that there is no right or wrong answer, but if you are moving around in fiction and autobiography, or like my friend, or like so many of us adapting source material from real people, you should consider your relationship to the material, how you feel about revealing what is and isn't true and why. So I made the choice to talk very openly about how the stories in this angel on my chest are personal and about my first husband. And I'll admit, I made a very different choice with admit this to no one, which I would like readers to view simply as stories, most likely because I don't see myself at all as any kind of expert on race in America and I should not speak as one ever. So the personal angle of that book is for me, a private one, me reckoning with my own hypocrisy, my own complicity, and that's okay too. When thinking about how to write your own life, you can do it privately, which leads to this, my last general observation before getting into some nuts and bolts. And throughout, I constantly wrestled with the so what principle, just because something happened to me, so what? Memoir is if it can't move beyond, hey, here's a bunch of crap that happened to me that one time. That writing can be meaningful to you or to your family, and there are all kinds of ways to write and different purposes. Maybe someone just wants to write the story of their life for their family to enjoy. 
Maybe the private practice of journal writing brings peace and personal insight. But I'm a professional writer, always aware of an audience and, and an outside audience will be wanting to find the so what of the writing. I was reminded of one of the masters of memoir, Vivian Gornick, who writes in her classic craft book, The Situation and the Story. She says, what happened to the writer is not what matters. What matters is the large sense that the writer is able to make of what happened. For that, the power of a writing imagination is required. As V.S. Pritchett once said of the genre, it's all in the art. You get no credit for living. And so obviously fiction too must be responsive to these concerns and become more than just a recitation events, especially what's called literary fiction. But it's my sense that the general public kind of has an understanding of this already, maybe from some distant English class where they've been taught to find symbols or what the author meant with an image. And I suspect the world at large understands that fiction is crafted and perhaps that makes them a little more fearful of simply diving in the way someone might say, I'm gonna write my life story and sell it and make a million dollars. Plus, as we know, there are perfectly wonderful types of fiction that by definition don't have to make that leap of so what and are purely entertaining to read. Mysteries, romances, spy thrillers, sci-fi, all, all that. So as a fiction writer, there is a place where the story can be enough. But unless you're a celebrity, it's likely that your life story is going to need that extra resonance where your work is going to have to answer that so what question, where your personal experience is going to have to move into the universal in some profound way. And I knew that for me, my book about my husband was not self-therapy, it was not catharsis, as some might imagine, but that I wanted it to be a book, an artful shaped work. And I knew and know for sure, no one is clamoring to read my thoughts on race. So how to shape a life, my life, into a book, into a story, into something artful. So I've been talking about some big picture things that were helping me get to that space of shifting my life into an artful book. But what about the nuts and bolts? How can we get busy with our writing and apply these larger principles? How exactly might one approach writing fiction with this hard material from our lives? So I'm gonna talk about a few strategies that evolved from my writing process. So when approaching autobiographical material, I think that having some distance is essential, emotional distance and also literal time, preferably years. There's one story in this angel on my chest that I wrote right after Rob died. The first thing I wrote period after he died, it's called 10 things. Then I didn't write overtly about him hardly at all for 14 years. So a lot of time had passed since my husband died. Often as I was writing the stories in this angel on my chest, the life I was describing didn't feel like my own exactly. My work, even though personal, often seemed as if I were writing fiction because so much time had passed. I found myself thinking about working on a book rather than working on my life story. And this is not to say there weren't times where the material felt fraught and made me cry and stirred up feelings, just that at times thinking book instead of life was helpful. And having all that distance between myself and the experience was definitely helpful. As for writing about race from the view of a complicit white person, I didn't learn the name Trayvon Martin and start writing. I didn't read about Michael Brown and get busy. I took lots and lots of time and wrote knowing that as more time passes, my writing on this topic will be informed in new ways. Form can help you find distance. Lists, craft lecture, second person. I use many different strategies in this um, angel on my chest 
instead of um, relying exclusively on a story beginning, middle, end. And in fact, that's how I tackled what I would probably call the most personal stories. That was the way for me to tap into the harder emotional material. Also, remember, I'm talking about a book in which there are 16 stories and in each, a young husband dies. The truth is I had to do something different to make sure the reader didn't get bored. In Admit This to No One, the story of white suburban life is in the second person in a list in which the narrator asks the reader to pretend, as in, pretend that you never notice that there is maybe one black couple at the parties you go to. Pretend not to feel instant relief when you see that couple there. So that, that voice helps me sort of share things that I probably wouldn't share in my day-to-day -day life, things that I feel ashamed about. Or green in judgment in, in Admit This to No One is set in a grocery store where a white woman offers to pay for an item the EBT card won't accept. And that story includes a distant narrative voice offering commentary on how to write a story, which sort of is reminding the reader that they're reading a story. For example, every story needs an allusion to therapy, setting up characters who can be proud of their heightened self-awareness, and every story needs one bad decision. These techniques were ways to help me, the writer, access the uncomfortable actions the characters were taking that were sparked by uncomfortable things I myself had done. Humor can help you handle difficult emotional material as well. In This Angel on My Chest, in the story called A Quiz, I write in the form of a quiz and offer multiple choice answers to a variety of situations the young widow faces, using the humor to deflect the pain until the very ending. Once I was speaking at a university and in the Q&A, a young man who had been assigned to read the story said to me, there I was reading and laughing. And then all of a sudden I wasn't like you did that on purpose, like pulling the rug out from under me. And I felt uncomfortable. Exactly. I said with a smile and I thought, would you have kept reading if it wasn't funny? And this doesn't mean you have to be a laugh riot, but just look for moments to lighten up through humor if you can or self-deprecation. Another strategy is to add imaginary characters. The circle is set in a young widow support group, very similar to the one I attended, but I had to think about where the tension was. The young widows in my group all met and eventually they start to feel better. So that's lovely in real life, but that was not very interesting to read about. So I added Ruth, the therapist who runs the group, who was totally invented, and I gave her a problem. Here she is helping people heal themselves, and she's avoiding her doctors and her friend who want her to face the fact that she has breast cancer, that indeed she is dying. The women in the group don't know this, but the reader knows. I went to a support group. I met some friends who were similar to the two who emerged in the story, and there was a woman who led the group, but I have not one memory of what that woman leading the group looked like, and I certainly have no idea about any speck of her personal life. You can also add an event for drama. I wrote 10 things as a short story, and then in a strange turn, I rewrote it as nonfiction because I wanted to be published in the Washington Post. And the fictional version of 10 things, which is a list of 10 things about um, the narrator's husband, um, the, the fictional story is about 80% true. And people who read that story um, and talk to me about it, they also, they often love little tiny details, like how my husband once described me as an avocado. And that part's true, but that didn't happen after a dog died. And there was nothing in real life as dramatic as me kissing his best friend to create that necessary wallop of an ending. I invented that to make the story better. And you need to also be sure to remove the dull and irrelevant details my story, Someone in Nebraska, is a literal true story set in a true bar I spent time in during a writing residency. But in my story, I didn't have to talk about the other bar flies or describe the town I was in because I gave in this, the impression in the story that it was someone passing through. I didn't talk about how nervous I was to go in there. I didn't talk about the cheeseburgers on the menu. I didn't reflect exactly the rambling way Dallas 
told the story of seeing the white light in her near death experience. Um, she, she took longer than my short story takes me to read out loud to tell her story. I gave her a good name that I knew she would like. Her name isn't really Dallas um, because I was basically stealing her story and I cared about her. And I apologize to her personally because in the story required that she not be pretty and she was pretty. So I did choose to tell her about the story, but you don't have to. You can write in secret and you can publish in secret as long as you understand that it is possible someone will find out. Unfortunately, I've heard some amazing stories of people who would never find my story in the Southwest Review who did. And I think we all have read Bad Art Friend and um, know have, have opinions about all that. So it's a topic always worth considering. So I did tell this woman that I was using her story and she, she was fine, she was excited actually. And so in a larger sense, also remember that you can remove anything you want in the fiction and the nonfiction. There are plenty of things that were hard and true about losing Rob that I simply wasn't gonna write about. I had my reasons, which really are irrelevant because I don't want to, can be its own reason, as long as the story doesn't need that element. I think it might be easier to eliminate things in the fictional version of your life. You can make up stuff to fill the gaps you don't wanna write about. You can condense or elude. And when someone in the know says, that's not how it happened, you simply say, I'm writing fiction. And of course, here we go back to what I was saying earlier about thinking about your relationship to the truth. Does your story need that stuff you're cutting out? I decided that my book didn't, but if it did, I would have had to include it because you, what you don't wanna do is cut things out that the book needs, that the story needs. You don't wanna shy away from material just because you're afraid. It needs to be a purposeful decision made in the service of the art. So in Admit This to No One, which is an exploration of power dynamics set in Washington, DC, it needed, I felt, a reckoning with race, even though I knew that would be very hard for me to write. But the book required it, so I did my best. And as for eliminating facts in the nonfiction, in the memoir, again, you know that going in, you can't include everything. But here, if there is something of relevance, even if it's hard, it seems to me that you're going to have to include it. I'll share a story from a beginning writer I know who is working on a memoir about a difficult time in her family's life. And I was her, her mentor in our low res um, MFA program. I was reading some early chapters and I just, I just had the sense there was more to the story, but um, I didn't push her, she didn't feel ready. Eventually she confessed to me that her marriage almost ended and I waited, I read some more work, and several months later, in a different semester, she revealed that she, in fact, had cheated on her husband. And now she knew that the story, her memoir, needed that information, though it would be hurtful and hard to dredge up those events. So I was extremely proud of her at that moment. She was making the choice a real writer would make. The memoir would have been false without it. So again, all this goes to the deep thinking you'll need to do as you examine your material and think about the thing you're writing. You don't have to include it all. You literally can't include it all. So why are you choosing to include what you do include? Another strategy that was very helpful for me was to write about the writing. I did this in, in my book, This Angel on My Chest, um, the, the story index of food, which is um, pretty much an exploration of my guilt about writing a book, about trying to get published, about using this terrible thing that happened to me as material. But you could also, instead of writing a story about that, you could also keep a writing journal as you push through the difficult material, especially if you're working on a long project. How does it feel to write about this material? How does it feel to dig so close to the bone? How are you finding yourself thinking differently about your family members? What challenges have you had? What triumphs? 
The revelations along the way may find their way into the material directly or may feed the project indirectly, deepening your thinking about this time in your life. And another reminder, having the veil will make you braver. If you've been struggling with a story you feel you must tell, but you're worried about family or whoever, imagine if you could tell that story and they wouldn't see themselves. That's what fiction is. I told you that I didn't write overtly about Rob or my grieving until I wrote This Angel on My Chest, but my second novel, A Year and a Day, which was written after Rob died, is set in 1975 in Iowa, is about a 15-year-old girl whose mother has committed suicide, and the book is about the year after that tragedy. So it's all about grieving and loss as Alice struggles to cope with what has happened. And in my mind, it's all about what I went through after Rob died. But it's set in Iowa in 1975, about a 15-year-old girl and a dead mother. Not one thing on the surface sounds like that part of my life after I lost Rob. It's fiction. And finally, I want to address the urgency of being brave. And while this statement means be brave in tackling difficult and personal material, it also means be brave in your pursuit. Follow your instincts, even as they lead you down a ludicrous path of writing 16 stories about dead husbands, stories that are both true and not true, or a story careening around with 10 points of view. In the end, the only, only unbreakable rule is to be interesting and to tell a good story, a story that reaches deep into your reader's heart. You can't pass off something invented as fact, not yet, not entirely, supposedly, but you can and should simply tell your story and let the genre labels figure themselves out. Why worry about the sort of detail like what they will call it on the bookstore shelf when you are the writer, you're the teller of a story. Deep in the bowels of the literary world, we know there are all kinds of writers experimenting and blurring fact and fiction and creating hybrid genres. Don't be afraid to join them. David Shields, John Degada are two names on the nonfiction side. Carl Ove Nosgaard with My Struggle, six or seven or 10 volumes of his life will be on the fictional side as well as Sheila Hetty. There are lots of others. We are all of us artists and adventurers. We wouldn't turn to writing if we weren't really. All we have to do is use words. There are no other rules. Use words and be interesting. Tell your story first. First, tell your story. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Leslie. That was fabulous. And let me just say this. I met Leslie. I kind of hunted her down. I read her story, 10 Things in the Washington Post magazine that she spoke of. And when I read it, it was so riveting. All I could think of is, I have to find this writer. I have to find her and let her know that that story spoke to me. And it was incredible because when I found out she was in our region, all bets were off. I was going to know who she was. But she's an incredible, thoughtful, um, that was completely inspiring. And um, I hope you guys got what I got. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna hold off on questions after we speak to our next writer, who is um, Sherry Jones, who resides in Barbados and is a writer, mother, and a lawyer. Her short fiction has been published in Pink, Ecletica, Reflex Fiction, and The Feminist Wire, and broadcast on BBC Radio 4. Sherry, I, mean, I, I want you to probably correct me the way I'm saying it. She's a graduate of the MA Writing Program at Sheffield Hallam University, where she was awarded the Archie Markham Award and the A.M. Heath Prize. She's also a past fellowship awardee at the Vermont Studio Center. Her first novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction 2021. It's a novel of great elegance and verve. Hard to believe it's a debut, says Maggie O'Farrell. Bernadine Evaristo calls it a hard-hitting and unflinching novel from a bold new writer. Please give a warm welcome to Sherry Jones. Hello, 
thank you, everybody. And you are right, uh, Carla. Sherry is the way to pronounce it. So thank you. Um, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here to talk to you all this evening about the craft of writing and specifically about writing about violence in my novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House. Um, special thanks to you all for coming and thanks Carla for the awesome job you've done in bringing us all together and organizing this event. So if you followed any of the previous interviews I've done about this book, you might have heard that I received this story on a bus on a freezing winter evening in 2008 while living in London. You might have heard that the character of Lala sat with me on that bus and started to tell me her story. You might have heard that I raced home to start writing it and I worked on it all through the night until the following morning. What you might not have heard is that the scene that first came to me that night is the one when the novel's protagonist, and that's Lala, fights with her husband, Aiden to hold their newborn baby, a fight that ends with the death of that baby. What you might not have heard is how many times I put the manuscript down during the 10 long years after that night and before its eventual publication. What you might not have heard much about is why. The why has to do with how wrenching it was for me to write the violent scenes in the novel, it has to do with my own personal story as a survivor of domestic violence. And the why is also a big part of the reason why I'm here tonight. So for those of you who might not have read it, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House is a novel about a hair braider called Lala, who lives and works on a pink powdery beach in paradise. Only for Lala, life is less than idyllic. She's married to Aiden, a career thief and weed smuggler whose cunning at his craft is surpassed only by his cruelty towards his wife. When we meet Lala, she's about to give birth to their baby on the same night that a wealthy tourist is murdered in the botched robbery of one of the mansions not too far away from where Lala and Aiden live. The story is about how the two events, the birth of the baby and the murder of this Taurus, are connected. But the novel is also about race, class, and privilege in paradise. It's about the tension between the carefully curated ideal of the picture postcard perfect island getaway sold to rich Taurus and the brutal reality of life for the locals who live there. It's about what one society requires of its women, how those requirements restrict them, and how they survive. It's a story about love, and it's a story about domestic violence. The violence throughout Lala's story was a large part of why it was so hard for me to finish the novel. While none of the violent incidents in this novel happened to me, they did resonate resonate very deeply with me because of my own experience. I lived in Lala's world for a very long time while writing this novel, and I often experienced the trauma so intrinsic to her story right along with her. Which brings me to my first question. If violence is so difficult to write about, then why do we write about it? Why should we write about it? In preparing to talk to you tonight, I did some research on what other writers had to say about writing about violence. And I came across this quote um, and it's attributed to E.V. Declare, which I, I think so eloquently and succinctly rephrases the question. Maybe the question is not why, but how. How in a world so teeming with stories and narratives of violence, do we write violence? If writers are to participate as creators or recreators of violence in literature or to respond to it, how might we write it in a way that's not exploitative, aggrandizing, or gratuitous? 
And how do we participate as readers, as spectators of violence? We have to write about violence, in my opinion, because it is real, it is true, it is part of human existence, and it is certainly important for some stories. If we as writers choose to write a particular story, if we commit ourselves, our skills, our creative abilities to serving that story, then we can't help but write about violence. I don't think we can avoid writing about violence if we write authentically, but I do think we can choose with care how we write about it. I'm a writer from the Caribbean, as Carla said, from Barbados, which is a small island, 166 square miles only. I was lucky enough to be exposed to the work of several Caribbean writers as I was growing up. One of the things which struck me about the work of, of many of these writers, as I came to know myself, not only as a woman, but as a Black Caribbean woman writer, was how these writers wrote about violence and specifically violence against women in their work. Too often in storytelling, in my view, violence against women is graphically portrayed with a physicality and spectacle that elicits an awe for the act of violence itself, instead of empathy for the tragedy of the event and the negative repercussions on the victim and the wider community. As such, the reader is distanced from the character's traumatic experience and instead forced to witness the performance of it, often re-victimizing and dehumanizing the women who suffer this violence. In the work of many of these mostly male writers, women were portrayed as the object of the violent act, rendered in a way that left them voiceless and that stayed away from how they felt and experienced these events and, it's, and the wider impact of those events on the communities in which they live. Now, I've given a few examples um, on your handouts of some of the stories from the Caribbean, which I read and which would have addressed violence against women. You can read them at your leisure and perhaps, hopefully, um, the entire you know, work the novels in which they appear. But I'll refer to two now and I'll read um, from two of these novels. So specifically, I'm going to compare two accounts of a violent incident against a woman from the work of Roger Mayes, who, were, who wrote The Hills Were Joyful Together, which was first published in the 1950s. And then I'm going to read an extract, very short extract from Lisa Allen Agostini's the Bread the Devil Need, which was published only this year. So in Roger Mays' novel, violent incidents are relayed with cinematic spectacle in graphic detail while objectifying the female victim. Near the end of the novel, for example, a character by the name of Euphemia is murdered by her lover for cheating on him and the killing is relayed in gory detail without reference to her trauma. So here's the extract. Shag was standing over her with the machete raised aloft. It was stained with blood. She put her arms as though to ward off the blow. Three fingers were shorn off clean. They fell into her lap. She screamed again, long and high pitched. And that was the last time. The very next blow severed her windpipe and the point of the machete traveled diagonally in a straight line across her right breast. But she was still alive and her eyes stared up at him in horror as he slashed and slashed at her with the machete. One blow lopped off the left arm clean above the elbow and laid her abdomen open. Her entrails spilled out upon her lap. In my view, tellings of this sort, devoid of any reference to the feeling and anguish of the victim of the violent act, or even the perpetrator, 
do little to inspire empathetic unsettlement in the reader. And I do believe that in writing about violence, empathetic unsettlement is an objective that we should aim for. The horror of the occurrence becomes awesome spectacle in tellings of this sort, separated from the psychic damage that it causes not only to the victim, but to the community. In contrast, in Alan Agostini's novel, violent incidents against women are relayed using what I term a poetics of omission, which focuses a lot less or not at all on the physicality of the act itself and more so on its impact on the victim. And here's the extract from The Bread the Devil Need. I take one sip. The mobby was bitter. I skin up my face before I could control the expression. I know he see. I try to sit the glass exactly in the ring of water that show where Leo first put it down for me. Just so the plate, the glass, and my face went flying to the floor. Callaloo was dripping from my hair. I had mobby in my eye. Whether we like it or not, writing is a political act. And in writing How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, I thought very carefully about how I wanted to relay the incidents of violence in the novel. Writing fiction which thematically addresses domestic violence poses several challenges of creative choice. The reality is that many victims of violence against women are denied agency even in the telling of their stories. Newspaper articles and media reports re-victimize survivors and appear to perpetuate the male gaze in prioritizing the grotesque details of the violence, perhaps in an effort to sensationalize accounts and sell more newspapers, for example. Or, infect, or, or are infected with terminology which attributes blame to the female victim and reinforces traditional gender positioning, stereotypes, and ideals. In writing How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, it was really important for me to achieve a narrative balance between authentically portraying the lived reality of so many females and employing revolutionary poetics in a narrative which made possible a transformational leap in, the, in our collective consciousness about violence against women. In an article titled The Poetics of Horror, Representations of Violence Against Women in Israeli Women's Literature, Shai Rudin states, a radical feminist poetics that combines different genres is better able to reflect the individual female trauma. Hence, female testimony cannot be bound to existing realistic codes. In literature and outside of it, horror has poetics of its own. Referring to the examples of women's literature surveyed, Rudin posits that there's a particular aesthetics for representing violence against women. He refers to a number of creative techniques employed by Israeli writers in representing domestic violence in their work, comprising so-called radical poetics, which refers to the departure from chronological realistic narrative um, adoption of fantasy, naturalism, impressionism, stream of consciousness writing, symbolism, fictional confession, and surrealism, highlighting the abuse of women in non-realistic ways. That's number three. So there were three elements so far. I should have probably numbered them. And finally, rewriting patriarchal sexual codes by representing abusive and violent behavior against women in stories in a way that promotes a shift in the relationship between the sexes and clarifies that the common traditional patterns do not allow women to live fully or even to survive. Once I understand myself to have received a story to work on, I actively employ creative techniques in crafting the story so that it is, in my estimation, fully realized. 
While I did not set out to write a story about domestic violence, I understood myself to have been inspired to tell Lala's story as I received it, which of necessity required a thematic treatment of domestic violence. I understood the choice of techniques in telling that story to be my own. And those choices required reflection on the usefulness of the techniques involved and their impact on the realization of the story and on the reader. When I wrote this novel, I knew first of all what it would not be. I knew that its depictions of violence would not be graphic, would, would not elevate the event to spectacle or relegate the woman to object. For me, the experience of violence was too personal to risk losing the reader in the act itself instead of its impact. In writing How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, I therefore focus at least as much on what I on what I would not say about violence as what I would, as on what I would. I drew on the concept of a poetics of omission in telling this story and also employed elements of non-traditional narrative in writing it. And I'll give a few examples. So in the story, when Aidan, Lala's husband and the father of their baby, is questioned by the police about baby's disappearance and beats Lala as a result, the incident is relayed as follows. It must have been something she said. Thwack, thwack, bitch. What did she tell the police? Thwack, stop screaming and answer. Does she know what they do to people who talk to police where he come from? Bang, crash, were fucking rassle, bitch. What did she tell the sergeant? What? She want him now? She want the sergeant? Whiz, sing, slap, fucking rassle, whore. In chapter 27, when Lala interrupts Aiden while he is praying before a robbery, for example, and suffers his violent reaction as a result, there is no gratuitous, grisly description of the impact of his violent response on Lala's body, and therefore, to my mind, no objectification. The impact of the act is shown on the other inanimate, on the inanimate objects in the room. Lala sighs without thinking. She makes a loud sound that reminds her of tearing paper. She watches Aiden's lips stop their caress of David's words, and she sighs loudly again for a different reason. She watches her hand jerk, sees the cup fall, the rice scatter, watches the pages of the Bible flutter, sees the Psalms of David submerged. Survivors of domestic violence are often voiceless. Their experiences can cause over time a literal and connotative loss of voice and a heightened sense of fear covered by, caused by post-traumatic stress. I had to find a way to make this story unquestionably Lala's story, while at the same time reflecting her lack of agency in telling it, which is generally the case in real life. Early drafts of the novel were written in the first person from Lala's point of view, but this was creatively problematic for several reasons. First of all, it allowed Lala an agency and a vocal power not supported by real life accounts and which could therefore underm undermine the authenticity of the narrative. Secondly, the truth is that many survivors are so traumatized by their experiences as to be stuck in patterns of unhelpful rumination in their retelling or to demonstrate dissociation in other ways, which could negatively impact pacing, as well as elevate Lala's unreliability as a narrator 
to the point that the reader could have found it difficult to identify with her. So for example, in earlier drafts, Lala repeatedly ruminated on the incident that resulted in the death of her baby. In those early drafts, baby's death was portrayed over several chapters, which always involved Lala retelling the incident with additional details added or removed, by which the reader was expected to approximate what had actually happened on the night that baby was killed and who was at fault for her death. However, while the repeated rumination on the incident might have been authentic and consistent with the real and expected psychological trauma of abuse, to include it in the narrative in this way would have negatively impacted the pacing of the novel in a manner that was difficult to alleviate through other means. I therefore changed the main point of view to that of a limited omniscient narrator in third person and generally made this the same for all main characters. However, Rudin's theory of the inadequacy of traditional linear storytelling in novel format for the telling of stories about violence against women was true for me in writing this novel. A simple third person account felt somehow insufficient in the rendering of this story, inadequate to truly represent the horror of the violence suffered by Lala. The theme of domestic violence is weighty subject matter and some of the incidents suffered by the main protagonist in this novel required me to choose techniques and perspectives that would encourage the reader to enter the room created by the story, to discover that the room entered was a house of horrors, to start to experience that horror and to be terrified by it, and yet to sit there willingly while the door was locked after them and then not reopened until the story ended. Further, a heightened level of empathy was required to ensure reader identification with the characters in the novel, especially Lala, that I felt would not be adequately addressed by the distance afforded by a simple third person rendering, which allows for the illusion of separation between a woman in Lala's circumstances and the wider community, including the reader, and perhaps a resulting tendency to judge or to blame. While I wanted the reader to identify with Lala and to empathize with her, I did not want the reader to over identify with Lala to such an extent that they would be unable to appreciate Aiden's character, for example, and by extension, to empathize with the fact that many abusers were themselves abused at one point or another. So this ideal of achieving empathetic unsettlement in the reader was therefore a consideration when making creative, not creative choices about the narrative point of view and the telling of the story generally. I eventually chose to tell the story using a number of points of view. For example, chapter one starts with a third person account of the birth of baby and the narrator follows Lala through the harrowing circumstances surrounding that birth. By chapter three, however, the narration has shifted to second person, singular, and the use of the pronoun you becomes both an invocation to the reader to inhabit the action in the story and evocative of the dissociation Lala suffers as a result of the trauma she experiences because of her husband. And I'll just read a short extract. So even now with baby sleeping open mouth between the two of you, when you are reassured of reality by the chirping of birds, the swish of the coconut leaves and the roar and retreat of the waves below, even now you can look into the face of the man snoring on the other side of that small baby and wonder who he is. You can see those thin, spiteful lips slackened into pleasantry by sleep and forget how they feel when he kisses you. 
I felt that the structure of the novel had to allow the reader to experience firsthand, not necessarily the gruesome acts of violence, but the psychological trauma, community alienation, hypervigilance and stress suffered by Lala and the community of women like her. Switching points of view in telling the story helped to establish the sense of dislocation, alienation and distortion of reality suffered by victims. And the reader also endures a series of foundational shifts in narrative, which mirror the fundamental shifts in experience and understanding of reality, which Lala would have suffered as a result of the violence she experienced. The novel therefore slips in and out of a variety of points of view and perspectives and it employs several techniques that challenge traditional rules of structure and language. For example, while a narrative is often read as if the narrative voice is telling the reader a story or giving a testimony, and therefore is delivered as a visual rendering of an auditory experience, which may include the imagining of the employment of other senses. Several parts of the novel remove the narrator and seek to replicate or require an immediate visual or auditory engagement on the part of the reader. For example, in chapter 20, when the reader is allowed to witness Sergeant Beckel's interrogation of Lala on the beach, the reader experiences the visual evidence of Lala's distress at being questioned firsthand by the representation of the sight of it in the bracketed sections of the text. So here's, here's that extract and you won't be able to see it, but I'll just, I'll just um, read it. Oh, tone. Lala would say, yes, yes, I know him. And her hands would start to trip over themselves to drop the silken strands of flaxen hair before her so that she will have to start the cornrow all over again. Over, stop, over, under, stop, over, stop, under, stop over, under, over, under, over, under, stop. So coming to the end of my talk, I just wanted to, to give a few thoughts um, about techniques that are useful in writing about violence and in thinking about how you might want to write about violence in the stories that you will go on to write or that you were writing. So the first um, thing I wanted to say about that is that every element of the narrative, in my view, should be in service to the story. And the violent act must earn its place like anything else in the narrative. And so there's some important questions to ask when trying to write about violence. What is the purpose for including this act? Is it, how does it advance the plot? Is the purpose development of a character and therefore how must this act, this violence be written in order to achieve that particular purpose? Now, I am one of those writers who believes that the physical description of the act of violence is perhaps less impactful than the telling of the psychological aspect of it. Narrative psychological apprehension for me is preferred to graphic depictions of violence. The impact to me of the omission of the act itself and leaving space for the inferences to be made by the reader not only encourages reader engagement, but it often helps because the reader's perception of the act itself is made larger 
in their own imagination. It is, it is elevated to the level of something so horrible it can't even be said outright in the text and the reader's imagination kind of does the rest. I have a note here about the importance of um, considerations of the genre in which you're writing. Now, in making this note, I do ask, however, how relevant or how important this consideration is to the story. For me as a writer, I think a lot less about genre and I think more about the story that I'm trying to tell. If, however, you are writing in a particular genre and there are certain conventions as it relates to violence, you might want to consider this in writing your story. So I started out by telling you that the scene that first came to me that night on the bus was the one where Lala and Aiden tussle over holding their newborn baby. And I want to end by reading an extract from the novel, which contains that scene. So you can see um, how it ended up in the manuscript after I had thought about all of the things that I told you about today. So I'm gonna read um, from page 46. And like I said, this is the point at which Lala and her husband Aiden are tussling over their baby. When Jacinth reaches out to take baby from Aiden, to join him in hugging and holding and cooing over how beautiful she is, Lala strides over and says she must feed baby first. It is past time for her feeding. She lifts baby from Aiden's hands before he can respond straightens baby's pale yellow smocked dress and obscures her navel again. The baby, startled by the sudden loss of admiration and the sound and sight of her father's fawning, threatens a cry, but Lala pays no heed. Perhaps it is the tenderness with which Aiden retrieves baby from her arms before she can fetch the bottle and proffers her again to Jacinth. Perhaps it is the maternal madness that epilogues a, re a recent birth. Perhaps it is that they're both a little house mad from being locked inside, Aiden in the tunnels and Lala with baby, because they have to be careful. They cannot afford for Aiden to be seen. Perhaps it is everything that came before it or nothing in particular, but whatever it is that makes Lala not understand what she is starting, it is a costly deficit. Everything deteriorates. Aiden lowers his eyes from Jacinth, but does not look at Lala. He looks at the ground as the sound is sucked out of the room. Give me back, baby, is what he says to Lala. I got feed she, Lala protests. Tone stops squeezing his locks, closes the window against the rain. It get him ready to clear up, he says. We go on here, Ada. Go get this girl home before it comes down properly. Give me back, baby, Aiden insists. Jacinth jumps up, relieved to have received the signal from Tone to go. She says to Aiden, is okay. She will come back to visit some other time. She will see baby again then. Let her have her feed. She look hungry and true. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Aiden. Lala holds baby closer, feels her stiffen and start to claw, refusing to be drawn into her own mother's bosom. Aiden, insistent, tugs baby back while sucking his teeth. A custard colored booty falls onto the hardwood floor and does not bounce. Aiden is holding onto a little naked foot. Baby wails again. Aiden is twisting the baby's legs away from Lala. Jacinth is heading towards the door. 
tone is approaching Lala and Aiden as they start to move with the baby suspended between them. Lala reclaims both legs. Aiden moves his big, big hands to baby's torso and tries to lift the baby out of Lala's arms. Jacinth has reached the door, is putting on her sandals. Tone stands beside her takes up much of the space in the doorway, keeps the light out, blocks the sight of Aiden and Lala struggling over baby. Thunder grumbles and barks. Baby jumps and both parents realize at once that this right of possession is scaring her. Neither wishes to scare her. Perhaps this is why Lala lets go of the little legs at the precise moment that Aiden lets go of her torso and baby plummets to the floor in a flailing plumage of pale yellow and chocolate and lands with a soft thump and is silent. Thank you. And it's hard to clap after hearing that scene. Oh, thank you, Sherry. Wow. Um, that was pretty amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think after last year, when I think about, um, you know, living between um, grief and rage, like having to just think about some of the violent things that occurred and to write about them in a way that, um, I think as you said, Sherry, that we um, think of different ways to do it. So we don't, so we pay attention to the victim, right? In a very different way. But thank you for that. Um, I think both of you have given us so many reasons that, um, that we, that we can pay attention to the words that we use, the strategies that we use, the structure even, and the idea of playing with structure that you have. Um, I wanna honor the people in the room. Um, please, um, if you have questions, raise your hands or just let us know that you wanna ask a question. I think we've had two amazing um, conversations and some ways they, they intersected in ways that I hadn't even thought of. But you know what a fabulous rendering of um, both the idea of writing violence and the idea of bringing, you know, fact to fiction. Now I can ask my questions, but please, anyone want to try it? We are very informal here. You can raise your hand. You can post it in the chat. Okay, let's start out with Joe. You want to unmute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, both of you, great job. I, I really like both of your talks. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, both of you were talking about like playing with narrative and structures, like Carla was saying, um, and like the quiz form that Leslie brought up. And um, I was just wondering, because I like to do that in my own writing as well, um, how you write that way without it coming off as sort of a gimmick. Mm. That's a great question. Um, sometimes it, sometimes I don't know. You have to work really hard because sometimes it does feel like a gimmick, and you sort of have to know that um, that's the risk that you're taking. And I guess what I would say to keep it from being a gimmick, or what has worked for me, is to um, write my hardest hardest material goes there so that even though it's sort of oh this funny quiz or oh this list of food in in this book about grief that the emotional impact is there it's not just a funny quiz I mean that's not to say that one can't write just funny work but for me um, that I believe is how I struggle with that and, and um, most of the time, too, I interrogate what I'm doing, that is, the stories didn't usually start out in that sort of form that I worked my way into that. I was trying something else and not getting to that vulnerable state. And so I thought, how can I, 
what can I do to shake this up and push sort of both push myself deeper and then give myself protection, I guess. So I would say, go for it with that hard emotional truth. And how could someone find that a gimmick if you are spilling your guts in the form of a quiz? So for me, in, in trying to use any particular um, you know, form or, or structure or any element of storytelling, you know, I look at everything that I do, each creative choice that I make as being in service to the story and therefore it must have a purpose. So in writing a story, I'm unlikely to start by saying, you know, I wanna write a story in the form of a list, you know, that might be fun. There may be some legitimacy in starting that way, but for me, there has to be something about that story that justifies that particular approach. There must be something um, in using that approach that is of value to the story over any other option. And that helps. The other thing I would say is, you know, putting the story down and coming back to it is really um, underrated, you know, I like to think that I'm pretty ruthless when it comes to editing, but you know, like any other writer, I'm also human and we do get a little caught up in, you know, wow, like a story in the form of a list, like that's great. Like I'd like to do that, you know, that would be wonderful. Like, let me try and see how good I am or I could be at doing this. Um, I find sometimes that I do these things that I think are clever and are in service to the story. And then when I come back after some time and I look at it, it's kind of like, well, you know, what's the point? Like, this doesn't really do what I thought it did now that I have the benefit of some distance and some perspective on what I wrote. So I would say that those are the two things that help me. Um, probably don't always succeed, but I ask myself seriously how this particular form, how this structuring, how this particular creative choice is going to serve this story um, and serve it to, you know, better than any other choice, form, or technique might, um, or structure might. And then I also give myself the benefit of some distance and time. Um, and see if when I come back to it, you know, when I'm not so sort of, you know, happy about how clever I am to try this technique or, um, or to use it, just to come back and read it and see what impact it has on me as a reader. And that's usually a pretty good gauge for me in terms of how, how impactful it is. Um, I had a question uh, for you, Sherry. Um, in the way you uh, changed with POV, I'm wondering if you considered first person and um, if so, how it worked and if not, why not? So I did, um, I actually, the first draft of the novel of the manuscript was in first person. And um, I thought I, I tried to, to mention that the there were there were a number of problems with the first person for me. The first thing was that I didn't think it was authentic. In that, um, generally speaking, the reality is that many victims of domestic abuse over time, over an extended period, there is a literal and a connotative loss of voice. So the agency to tell the story in a way that the reader would understand and could rely on, could, could view this narrator as reliable. I felt that that was problematic in first person if this was to be on an authentic rendering. The second thing was that, you know, true to my understanding of the lived reality of, you know, many women like Lala, there is quite a bit of rumination going over these events. Um, when 
some victims get to the point of talking, um, if it's talking to a trusted friend or even if it's going over the event within the, the mind, there's a lot of sort of picking apart and, you know, replay. And I felt that that could cause, you know, if I wrote in the first person and I was true to that, my understanding of what um, that lived reality would entail in terms of telling this story from in the first person, um, that would have some really, that would cause some really big problems as it relates it related to the pacing of the, of the story. So, you know, you know, as I, as I said, I thought about just having you know, several accounts of that night that there's that tussle over baby, um, you know, which doesn't end well, of Lala thinking it over on several occasions and having little details added or subtracted in the retelling and to just intersperse those accounts throughout the rest of the narrative so that by the end of the novel, the reader kind of forms their own opinion of, of what really happened. But I found that really problematic um, when it came to the pacing of the story. So, you know, it was almost like after I got to a certain point, it was, you know, as a reader, I then thought, well, you know, I don't want to hear this again. You know, realistically speaking, this is like another account of that night with a slightly different um, detail. Um, that to me, that was asking the reader too much because, you know, I was the one writing the story and that's how I felt. And, you know, much to my dismay, when I was able to admit that to myself, a huge chunk of that novel came out and the entire thing had to be rewritten. And I then rewrote it in the third person. Um, and that posed its own, its own problems. And that's how I came to just have a number of different perspectives, including um, first person plural. There is one part of, of the novel that's written from the perspective of the community in which Lala lives. And that, that was very interesting um, for me to experiment with that. But I think it also, the, the multiple perspectives also help the reader to feel that sort of sense of, um, instability that Lala does as a result of her experience. So once readers are in that room and that reality starts to shift, those perspectives shift in that way and the structure shifts, I think it lends, that structuring um, lends itself to the reader's experience of the novel and of Lala's story. Great, thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful answer. Yeah, CLV is always so hard. It truly is. And um, I think you, the way you just described it, it kind of um, encourages us to shake things up a little bit, you know, to figure out, you know, what happens when we change inside of a story, you know, different perspectives for the instability, as you suggest. Um, Cynthia Weiner would like to know, do you write the, and this is addressed to both writers, do you write the whole first draft out at once or do you go slower and edit along the way? And are there any specific advantages or disadvantages of either method that you've found? Um, I'll start. Um, I think that in the ideal world, in the ideal world, I would write out the whole draft. And especially in a short story, it's sort of easier to do that because it's, it's shorter, you have it in your head and you just race through and then you find out what the story's, I always find out what the story's really about at the end. Then I go back and revise, which is the part of writing that I love the most. So first draft writing, I find very challenging. Uh, revising, I could sit and think about a comma for like an hour. So I'm always anxious to get through. But the problem for me is with a longer project with a novel is that you don't always have that giant space of time. Like Sherry, Sherry said, it took her 10 years to write her novel. And I have not spent 10 years on a book, but I definitely have spent years and years and years. And it's hard to keep it in your head. And then it's hard to just let 
10 years of bad writing pile up behind you and it's sort of depressing and you're like, I want to, I want to send something out. How come I'm not getting published because I'm writing this novel. So I do find myself when I'm working on a novel that I will, even though I know it's against my better judgment, I will stop sometimes go back especially if it's something that I think maybe a chapter that I could pull out and shift into a short story and try and get published and get some confidence, I will go back and revise things. But the problem, the disadvantage for doing that is because, as I said, in a story, I don't know what the whole thing is until I'm done. Same with a novel. It's like you finish that first draft and you're like, oh, that's what this book is about. Oh, I need these four chapters to add and I need to take out this character. You don't always know that. And so to spend a lot of time revising and making something perfect when you know it's likely to change in significant ways, um, that's daunting to me. So in the ideal world, I'd write forward, but I live in the real world and I do stop and edit sometimes. That is a really, really good question. And I smiled when I saw it. Um, for me, the first phase of my writing process is such that I feel as if I am receiving a story. It's almost as if I- Sherry, Sherry one second. It's a little hard to hear you. Can you okay. speak a little louder? Sure. Oh. Thank you. I'll a little closer as well. Yeah, hope this is better. Um, so I was saying that for me, the first part of my writing process is such that I actually feel as if I am receiving the story. It's almost as if, um, you know, I'm hearing it or I'm plugging into it somehow. And there's this urgency about getting it down while you know, I'm in that phase. And I do have these little quirks about writing it when I'm writing in that in that first stage, for example, I like to write from the back to the front of my writer's notebook, I like to write in long hand, you know, there's there are these little like quirks um, about writing in that stage. But for me, it really is a lot easier if I just try as hard as possible to get to the end. Um, I've had the experience before, and not so much um, in writing novels, but in writing short stories. Um, I've had the experience of not getting that first draft down fully and going back and putting my other hat on in terms of the crafting and the editing, and then feeling almost as if I've lost the story midway through. And it's it's really a lot harder for me after that to try to to get it back again and to and to put it down. So for me, if it's at all possible, I like to get to the end of the first draft before I start to edit. Let me ask both of you, um, you know, one thing's come clear that from both of your talks and what I've heard from different professors is the idea of um, write the story that frightens you, the one that scares you, the one that, um, you probably wouldn't reveal to the world unless it was written in a story. So for both of you, I mean, I mean, you touched upon some things that happened to you that you had to kind of put away and reflect on first. I think many of us can say that, but what, um, what, what made you believe you had it right, that it was the right time? You know, and to me, idea, the idea too, Leslie, of having to, um, um, contain your grief by placing it in someone else's, you know, something that was totally different from your experience, you know, with a, a, a child in Iowa. Like, what made you go there and how did you know it was right and you had finished with the story? That's, that's very interesting. So um, I think I, I'm one of those people, like probably some, many, all of you, like I just, I always wanted to be a writer. And um, writing really is just how I understand and cope with the world. So I didn't doubt that I would write about that grief at some point. And it, that was kind of a, a weird um, convergence that a year and a day, um, I wanted to write about Iowa where I grew up and then I needed a plot. And I, I it honestly just kind of came to me as like write about 
you know, grieving, right, about grieving. And um, my mother's mother died when she was 13. She did not commit suicide, but uh, my mother grew up without a mother. And that's been an, you know, an event of great impact throughout her whole life uh, for a variety of reasons. So I was sort of new. I'd probably write about all those things. So things sort of converged and I felt like it was very safe to write about um, Rob in, in that way. And again, that even though that was the book that I wrote after he died, it, I, you know, there were a couple of years of space, you know, like the first year after he died, I really just survived. And then I did think I was done with that. And then um, I was in like a really rough spot in my writing life. Like nothing was getting published. I'd written um, books that weren't getting published. I, it's it just, it, it was, I'm not going to say I was ready to give up, but I was, I was truly in despair about writing and um, to make a long story short, what I realized is that I wasn't really going for it, that I was kind of holding back, that I'm the first to preach to classes, you know, write about the scare, the story that frightens you. And I wasn't doing it. I mean, I knew I wasn't. And so I thought, I'm gonna go for broke. I'm gonna write about Rob. I'm gonna say it's all true. I'm gonna write true things. I'm gonna do that. And like, if that doesn't work, I don't know what's gonna work to pull me out of this despairing writing. And that was also, um, I think, why writing in secret was kind of helpful too, because I could just write and not worry about the outer world when I was working on that. So, yeah, I feel, um, I mean, I, I, it wasn't like to make myself feel better. I wanted to publish a book. I, I really wanted to publish a book and this was my life and I was gonna, I was gonna use it and turn it into art. That's what I wanted to do. Honest answer. So for me, um, I don't think it was, it was that conscious when it comes, when, you know, in terms of this particular novel. Um, I do feel that because of my own experiences as a survivor of domestic violence, that I was well placed to write about some of the things that happen in the novel, and certainly as it relates to the characters, to Lala's, well, and other characters. Sure, your volume's still a little bit low right oh, now. Sorry. Now it's, um, now it's perfect. Better now? Okay, I'll just sit a little closer. Yeah, so, so I do think that my own experiences, I was saying, um, put me in a better position to write it in terms of the psychological um, terrain and, you know, some of what these, right, what these um, characters would have experienced, even though the incidents were not taken from my own life. So, you know, and that, as Leslie says, that was the really difficult aspect of writing because while I didn't consciously set out to, to mine that experience and to use that experience, when I, when I received this story and I understood what the story was and, and what I was going to be writing about, it was terrifying for me because it made me sort of face some of my own demons. Um, and that for me did take quite a bit of courage. And that was why, you know, I was so enthralled and appreciative of Leslie's presentation because some of the things that she talked about in terms of how you use real life events in your fiction or, or real life experiences certainly resonated um, with me. But it was, it was terrifying. And I think that's part of the reason why it took so long. You know, I put it down um, sometimes for months at a time and worked on other projects and other things because it was so hard. So while I didn't set out to do it, I do think that writing this story was, a, was perhaps a little easier for me because of it and harder at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really, I do think my actual experience helped in, in writing this book. 
Thank you for that. We have one last question from Shay. How do you recommend sharpening your skills and your craft? Um, and please know that Leslie was able to put together a list of resources that um, um, pretty awesome list of resources and um, that would prove helpful. But do you have any other tips you can give about sharpening your skills and besides going to city lit events? I was going to say city lit events. No, you're the fact that you're here at an event like this at the end of a, probably a long day, that, that says everything. I think that um, I, I do, you know, I gave a list of a number of craft books and, you know, classes are helpful and so on. But one thing that I do that I love that I advocate is I write to a lot of writing prompts. And um, someone here is from my prompt writing group. We've been meeting for 10 years. And the, what I like about writing to prompts, the way it's set up in our little group, is that you can take a lot of chances and try things because it's just a prompt. It's not like, okay, I have these two hours. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write a whole story. That is so much pressure. But to just do some prompts either by yourself or with a friend or in a group, it's very easy to form a group. That is where you can try things out, like try writing a story in a list, try doing the second person, you know, try. I write, see what it's like to write that scary story, to just dip your toe in and just say, it's just a prompt, you know, no pressure. So I think that's one thing that I would advocate. Absolutely. I think for me, um, you know, there's the tried and true sort of reading as much as you can and seeing how other writers have done it and what has worked for them in the particular stories that they, they've um, been telling. Um, but for me, what I've also found really useful is just, you know, trying to access as much information and as much support as I can. So I'm also part of a writer's group um, in Barbados and, you know, a, a group that really engages in some serious critique and serious feedback. Um, we critique each other's work and we try as much as possible um, to be kind, but to be honest and to say what, what needs work. Um, and I've sought out communities like that throughout my, my writing life. So, you know, I will find the time to go and work on my writing exclusively for a while and then share that writing with other people um, who might be able to help me. Um, I've attended workshops, I've entered competitions. They're, they're in writing this novel, the first competition I entered was one in Barbados. Um, and the reward was, was really negligible, but there was one aspect of this competition that was so valuable to me and that was the opportunity to attend a feedback clinic with the judges and they actually sit down in a panel and go through with each person um you know the strengths and weaknesses of their entry so it, you know that is something that I couldn't pay for so it kind of didn't matter um what the prize was yes there's a validation yes there's a recognition but the feedback was priceless. And, you know, I am one of those writers. I believe that your story is your own, the story you're writing. You know how best to tell it and you will know when it's right. But it is valuable to get that perspective from, you know, people who read a lot and people who know about writing um, that can help you gauge sort of if you're achieving what you, what you intend to achieve. So those are some of the things that, that I've done to help improve my craft. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please unmute and help me, join me in thanking our guest artists today. They have been fabulous, Leslie Petrick and Sherry Jones. Thank you. you guys were extraordinary. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you yeah. learned from them as much, as much as we did. Please support them by following Yay. them on social media. Buy their books. Greedy Reads is an incredible independent bookseller. Please you know, go to that site, buy their books. Um, I don't think we could have asked for a better presentation. You were so incredible to us. Um, please, you know, the writers in this group, please um, fill out the link in our survey. Um, 
you should know City Lit is a very small literary organization. We've been doing this work since 2004. Your donations are always welcome. Support us by you know following us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Sign up for our mailing list on our um, website, citylitproject.org. Um, let us know how you feel. Because you know we, we listen, we read every single survey that's written, every single one of them. Um, please also check out our Becoming American series which we partnered with um, an author in Baltimore called uh, Sama Sidwat, um, 10, 10 immigrant women who find themselves in Maryland and their journeys here. Um, just know that we're all about literature. We have been, we're all about supporting writers. Our City Lit Festival, um, we always take a moment to talk about craft and we always uh, make sure we have writers who are gonna give you real talk about literature real we'll talk about the publishing industry, pretty much like these two authors did today. We couldn't have asked for a better presentation. Please take advantage of their, um, their um, handouts. We will make sure we send them again to you. Uh, we're gonna say goodbye to those writers right now. If the, any of the participants wanna hang out with us for the next 10, 15 minutes, please feel free to. But thank you, Leslie Petrick. Thank you, Sherry Jones. You guys are really, Seriously. Thank Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, wonder, wonderful being here. Thank you so, 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 so much. Thank Bye. You have been fabulous. Bye-bye. Both of you. Bye.